Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 97th episode. Oh no, it says 96 here. My script says 97. We've already slipped up. Anyway, in the high 90s numbers of episodes of this wonderful series, as we head towards the 100th, more and on about that later. But it's a great pleasure to introduce the guest today. It's an old favourite, Martin McKee. Now, yesterday we heard of the death of the journalist PJ O'Rourke, best known for um, his book Holidays in Hell. But I believe his earlier title for this was Travels with Martin, because no matter where PJ went around the world, he would be certain to meet up Martin out there helping restore or shore up shattered public health systems across the globe and even uh, at home. Martin is without any doubt the doyen of public health and epidemiology research and expertise in Britain, in Europe and everywhere. His H index, if it was his blood pressure, would get him admitted to ICU. And the only thing I know higher than his IQ is his air miles, at least until the panic pandemic struck. And I'm very pleased to say, as it's obvious, he's also a lovely chap and a good friend. So episode, I'm going to call it 97, this is Hiya Martin. We're going to talk about some big public health pictures uh, as we go along, but uh, and not dwell in the past as we try not to do in this series. But this is the COVID series, so we can't afford COVID. Let's start with a quick tour de horizon, horizon sorry, and the question of how are we now? And also, I just want to start with one question is, how do we know where we are now? Because it seems to have got a little bit more complicated when we first talked about this in episode four. Yes, it certainly has, Simon, and thank you for that introduction. <laughs> I barely recognised myself. <laughs> there is a real challenge because we've got, I guess, uh, well, a number of sources of data, and the problem is that they had been moving very much in parallel right through the pandemic, but they're now beginning to diverge. So we've got the ONS data, which are probably the best because they capture uh, a, a representative sample of the population. We have the daily COVID case tracker, which uh, looks at um, which um, captures people from who are, are registered in the testing and tracing program. And we have the Zoe app, uh, which is operated out of Kings, and they are now moving apart. So the Zoe app is giving an, a higher figure than the others. Uh, the daily cases are a little bit lower and uh, the ONS is somewhere in the middle. So I think that we, uh, I would tend to use the ONS data as the most reliable, but of course then we don't have that every day. That's the problem we only have it. Um, if we, we, we have a series of data, but I would go for that as the best data that we have. Okay, um, how, um, but what kind of, but can we still learn from the other sources of data as well? What, why, for example, has these, you know, we've been all hooked on, you know, the sonorous newsreader reading out the daily daily stats, et cetera. What, that must be telling us something. It's telling us that things, some things are going down, for example. We can trust trends, presumably. Uh, well, we could do if the rate of testing and reporting of testing was continuing in exactly the same way. E even at the height of the pandemic, it wasn't always because that sometimes there was a shortage of tests. So therefore, the true rate was probably higher than, well, in fact, was higher than the reported mm. figure. So it's very sensitive to testing capacity when the rates are very high. And at a time like this, where people are maybe not reporting the cases, uh, the, te the positive test, then it may, be, um, it may be underestimating the figures. So we need to look at it in the round. Fair enough. And when we now look at it in the round, what's the picture that you take from this in, 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 in you know, the snapshot of where we are now? Well, it's encouraging at present. So we have okay. been through the Omicron wave and certainly cases are going down. Uh, within that, it's slightly complicated because we've got two variants of Omicron and indeed there's some argument that the second variant, the BA2 variant, is really sufficiently different that it almost should be considered as a different variant altogether. And that is going up as a share. But uh, reassuringly, it does seem that people who are being infected by BA1 are not at greater risk of being infected by BA2. But we do need to remember that uh, we haven't had that much experience with them yet. So the rates are coming down, uh, hospitalizations, deaths are coming down. So it's looking good. But of course, as you would expect me to say, we've been here before. Yeah, I, I knew you would say that. Do you? Do? But let, let's just still stick with that then. Um, I mean, there's been increasing pressure on two things. One is rumours that the government may stop um, funding the ONS survey, 
Uh, now, as you said, it is without doubt the most reliable because it's true population, et cetera, et cetera. But it does also cost 400 million a year. So it's not free. Um, what's your, where, uh, what, when we don't do it for many other things in the way that we've done for, for uh, COVID, do you, do you think that we will continue to need that or that could, you can see a time when perhaps that won't be necessary? Well, if the first duty of a government is to protect the lives of its citizens, there are many other things that we spend a lot of money on where the link, the, the protective ability is somewhat less. And by chance, I was uh, talking to some of um, our colleagues in, in the Defence Medical Services yesterday, we were talking about uh, some of the expenditure in defence procurement. We could look at armoured vehicles that nobody can get into because of the uh, the noise levels there. We can talk about <laughs> yes. aircraft carriers where we don't have enough escort vessels and, uh, yes, and so on okay. and so forth. So I think in the totality of things, 400 million a year is not that much. And I'm not getting having a dig at defence spending here, but there are many other areas where we spend an awful lot more. And we need to look back. I mean, Maybe this is one of the reasons, but we have spent a lot of money on procuring PPE that didn't actually work. This is paying for something that does work. I wonder how long it would take you to say that, but fair point, fair point. But I think a stronger case, though, is there really isn't anything else that we report to the whole nation on a daily basis other than, than corona. We don't report all the other causes of death. There's, you know, We don't even do it weekly. We have for a long time settled on monthly reporting for those who are interested, most people probably aren't, and even then, not on the national news, but at least the data's available, on the main causes of death across the United Kingdom. Now, many people, and I count myself in this now, think, is it about time that we started to regularize the, the COVID data as well? Not to change it or suppress it, anything like that, but to bring it into line with the way that we report all the other serious causes of illness and death that we have in society. Well, certainly we do report things like flu data during the winter season, which is much more seasonal than, than COVID, where we've had waves, and those data are there. They may not feature on the news, but of course, that's an editorial decision as to what they actually feature. There's probably little point in reporting things like cardiovascular and cancer deaths because they don't change that rapidly. And indeed, we, work that I do in demography, publish papers from Croatia and Georgia, just as examples. If we see a big fluctuation in cancer deaths, it's a marker that there's a problem with the data yeah. and in, in both of those it was actually because of conflict so you go back and you find out what's going wrong uh, so you wouldn't expect that you would do that we are in the middle of a pandemic and I'm sure that if we had any other virus causing the pandemic we would be reporting those data as well but I, I have rather a, 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 I suppose coming going back to work that I did many many years ago that you're familiar with I always worry and I don't want to stretch this analogy too far, so please don't take it out of context, but I always worry whenever data are hidden away or not collected. And that's because, you know, I go back to a paper um, I wrote about the Soviet Union in the mid 1980s on, under Brezhnev when they stopped publishing the mortality data. And interestingly, Nick Eberstadt and others were pointed out that the health deterioration was the first marker that something was going seriously wrong because many other analysts at the time were looking at the growth of missiles, the space program and saying, you know, the Soviet Union is doing really well, but it was the health that went off. So I believe that looking at health data is always a very good indicator of the broader context of a society, but I'm not stretching, I'm not suggesting that we're in the era of Brezhnev by any stretch. No, I mean, and, and post, the fall of the wall that, that they were losing, wasn't it? One year of life per oh, year or something? Uh, something? Well, it was a huge, it depended where you were, actually. Yeah. And as you know, a lot of my early work was on that, looking at the post-Soviet mortality crisis, uh, but it was stagnating during the 1980s. Okay, and then dropping in the 90s. Dropping drama. Well, it got better in the Soviet Union in 1985-86 because of the anti alcohol right. campaign, and then it started falling apart about 1989. Okay. And it went up again and then fell after the 2004 um, financial crisis okay. and um, ruble crisis. In fact, there will be an opportunity for you and uh, Hans Kluge, uh, the WHO Regional Director. You're going to have your own programme because yes. of the RSM to go over this in much more detail. So I'm going to move on, just having flagged up that Hans has agreed to be interviewed by you, um, and I don't blame him. So we will be having him shortly, but not today. 
Um, now, lots of people are asking, or they asked beforehand, they're already asking now, which is the obvious thing to say is, um, and you've, you've already queued yourself for this, are we doing this, you know, how can we keep the, who's this, Jackie Connell, how can we keep the virus under control in isolation, testing and dashboard stops, and uh, Alana Safina, Jane Lampel, and many others have asked variations on the same question, all of which comes down to basically many, many people listening to this think we are li lifting the restrictions too soon. Are they right? Well, I think we need to look at what uh, you use the word restrictions. I would use the word protections. And I think that's an important framing because for many people and particularly people who are clinically vulnerable, they will see these as protections rather than restrictions. And in fact, they're protections that enable them to take advantage of the freedoms, knowing that their risk is going to be reduced if they go into spaces where people have been tested or wearing face coverings or, or whatever. So I think the language is, is quite important in that. We are still, we're still seeing case and incidence of uh, infection much higher than it was at many earlier points in the pandemic. So I think that we do need to keep monitoring it. I think it would be crazy to get rid of the surveillance at this point, particularly because of concerns about newly emerging variants. Now, I've been very critical of the UK, but our genomic sequencing is excellent, second probably mm -hmm. only to Denmark. And we should not be losing that. That's a huge capacity that will be important for future uh, pandemics as well. But I think we would be mistaken to think that we can go back to the status quo ante. We can't, because we now have a new coronavirus, which is not influenza. It's a comp it creates a complex multi-system disease. You know, we started off thinking that this was another respiratory pneumonia. And then we realized that it was leading to hyperimmune responses. We were seeing endothelial damage. We were seeing clotting. Then um, steroids were introduced to treat it. Um, and then and anticoagulants and other things. So then we realized that this is not just the common cold. It's not influenza. And the danger is that we've, we've thought, we, we've looked at other viruses and thought, well, we can handle it in the same way. We can't. So I think that as we go forward, we will be looking much more at making at, at emphasizing ventilation in the design of buildings, for example, mm -hmm. of using HEPA filters, which have proven to be very effective. And there was work from Addenbrooke showing how introducing that would, would really help. I think people will be wearing face coverings much more, regardless of what the government say, because people will recognize that, and of course, the main reason is to protect other people. But, but if you've got an FFP2 mask, it does protect yourself. Uh, I would hope that they will still have access to lateral flows because that will then allow people who might be thinking of visiting aged relatives in particular to test before they go and will give that degree of reassurance. And I think that's really, really important in all of this. You know, it's not that we've got millions of people who are just waiting for the government to say you can do things and take advantage. People are going to be very cautious going forward. So I think Regardless of what the government actually does, people will make their own decisions. And we have seen consistently that the population have been ahead of the government on these things. Yeah, I, I think that's undoubtedly true. And, um, and, and uh, given that no government would ever, for example, ban lateral flows or ban wearing of masks, I assume that, that wouldn't happen. Um, it will always be up to people to take those decisions. Well, they have done in some US states, remember? With oh, the sorry. Yes. Remember? Uh, yes, the OK. Yes, you're right. So, don't never assume anything. <laughs> no, okay, but I, okay, unlikely, unlikely, that unlikely. That happen. Um, but well, that, I'll jump ahead because I was going to ask this a bit later, but this is a good time to bring this in. Um, but it, it's about, and, and already Mark Petter has, has uh, asked us a question that's slightly against the flow of others about how the I'm paraphrasing now, but the, the flow of data from ONS, from the daily statistics, et cetera, is also perhaps maintaining public anxiety. And I wanted to specifically, well, do, uh, let's, let's pick up that question. That, you know, reassurance, it often isn't reassuring. Um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I can only speak for myself, but uh, I find the data reassuring in that some I know that somebody is actually monitoring the situation mm -hmm. and hopefully taking action as a consequence of it. You know, I take a lot of precautions now. I tend to be 
uh, somebody who does take, who, you know, who, who does try and assess risk in my own life, even though, as you say, I have worked in war zones and, and in, in many places where there has been a very direct threat, but you still, you, you know, one isn't reckless about these things. Um, you know, if you're in the middle of a war zone, you, you stay out of, um, you stay behind shelter. You don't walk down the middle of the road. I, in fact, I know somebody who did that and was shot. Uh, so uh, having having seen it. Uh, so I think you just have to be, I, I, I find the, the data really personally very reassuring. And I think a lot of other people do too, because it does tell, give me a message that somebody is taking this seriously and, and looking out to protect me and the rest of the population. I think, I think that's fair enough, but we, we do all also know that excessive reassurance and repeated reassurance actually increases anxiety mm. um, in basic psychological principle where actually people should be exposing themselves to, to the fear <coughs> situation. But they will can get lost in the psychology of that. I wanted, though, to get your... Let view. me just stop, if I may, on that one, of because course. I actually do agree with you on that, but you need to get it right. And in one of the more unusual pieces of research I did many years ago, <clears throat> we were interested, in, and this may be a question that uh, some of the, the viewers uh, may never have asked themselves, but you might know that the uh, Russian spacecraft uh, take off from Baikonur in, in, in Kazakhstan. And you might have asked, well, we know that the American second stages fall into the Atlantic or the Pacific. Where do the Russians fall? And they actually fall in uh, one of the oblasts down in the in the far east uh, if, uh, of uh, Russia. And so we did work looking at the people who lived under the fallout zone. And they were what we found was that those who received the most counseling and support actually had the highest levels of anxiety. Uh, so you do need to be a bit careful with these yep. things. I agree. So I think getting the messaging right is, is very important. Uh, yeah, but. It is. You're right. And um, Carol Ennisby points out, you know, public data is, uh, allows the public to adjust their behaviour, which is absolutely correct. Um, and indeed, it's very been clear throughout this pandemic, the public, as ever, are rather more sophisticated, as we've been writing about for years, than we think they are. But I want to bring a particular example to you that has been troubling you, me. Um, Steve Riker, who you know well, and we know well, he's been on our programme often, very, very good um, social psychologist, and he said in The Guardian a few days ago, um, and he was reacting, and he's quite strongly spoken, <laughs> um, but he said, it's crazy to remove masks in schools. Okay, he was, um, because that's the decision that's been taken. He said, that's crazy, because he said, people act according to the risks they perceive, which we agree, and this would be a signal that things are getting better, when actually we're not remotely out of the woods yet, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I found that uncomfortable because I felt that was moving a little bit too far to have children wear masks in order to encourage their, if you assume that their parents to vaccinate them. That, that's his argument. That if we didn't do that, parents wouldn't agree to vaccination. And given the equivocal nature of the data on masks, and indeed the equivocal nature on immunization in the, in the, in the younger population, before you start talking about the JCBI, because I know you're itching to do that, just tell me a little bit, though, what you think about how far can we go in, um, you know, in, in using one measure in order to increase the uptake of another? I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with it myself. Well, I think making that direct link might be going a little bit too far, but I think that in itself, given the high rates of transmission among children at the minute and the impact, I think in the last Department for Education uh, survey, there were something like 320,000 children who were off school on a in, in January, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of children that are missing school. There are a lot of st schools that are struggling to teach because of the number of teachers who are off. So there is a real challenge with infection rates. And even if children are, rel few children get seriously ill, but of course, few children get seriously ill from anything. So it, the, to, to say that children are less likely to get seriously ill from COVID than are adults, well, you could say that about almost any disease that you think of. Uh, children should not get seriously ill. They should not die. And, and some of them are. The numbers may be small, but they're still a lot more than they are for many of the other common, what were common childhood illnesses in the past. So I think that there is a strong argument for doing everything possible to reduce transmission in schools anyway. Now, I would prefer that we were doing much more in terms of HEPA filters, um, in terms of ventilation and things like that. I think that's okay, the best way taken. by doing it. And, and that's, you know, sort of uh, structural solutions rather than individual solutions. In all aspects of public health, I would argue that we should create safe environments rather than tell people what to do. 
But until we can get the rates of transmission down, and they're still pretty high, I think there's a strong argument for mask wearing in schools as it is. And what we are seeing is that for a lot of children, that does provide reassurance, and certainly for school teachers. So uh, that's one argument. But then I think, I, think, I think what Steve was probably referring to, and I don't want to put words into his mouth, was a lack of clarity around messaging and all of this. Because I think in the UK, we have had a problem of underplaying the risks to children, I would argue, compared to talking to my colleagues in paediatrics in the rest of Europe who see it and, and who look at the UK with a sense of wonderment in many ways. Uh, they can't quite understand why we are downplaying that because children have been dying. Children have been getting seriously ill. Children have been getting long COVID and the other complex of not just long COVID, even if we had a clear definition of it, but other long-term sequelae. And there are really big questions about what the longer-term consequences of COVID will be. So the argument that you should just allow children to be naturally infected is problematic. I think they also wonder why, when the MHRA had approved the vaccine for five to 11-year-olds in December, it's taken us till now to actually, for the JCVI to, to approve it, to agree to, to the rollout. And even then, in a very half-hearted way where they're almost the messaging and I'm sure it's not intended this way but the messaging about it being so equivocal when many of us think that it's not equivocal and certainly an analysis that we did in the journal of the Royal Society of Medicine in fact for the older age group showed using the putting the UK data into the US CDC model the, the benefits were absolutely clear so I think the, I think it's a response to that confused messaging uh, that is, in a way, another example of, I was going to say British, but probably English exceptionalism, where we seem to be out of line with much of the rest of the world. Remind me where you're from. No, no, don't. <laughs> we know where you're from. Okay. But thanks for the plug for their Royal Society of Medicine as well. Um, okay. Um, but on that subject of children, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a great fan, and you are as well, of more or less than Tim Hartford. Mm. And... I, I don't know what you think about uh, old Spiegelhalter, but we're a great fan of his as well at the RSM. Yeah. And both of them said the same thing in recent weeks. David accompanied to music on, on Desert Island yeah. Disc, do listen to it, and uh, Tim on more or less, which was uh, one of those things that makes you think that actually fewer children have died during the pandemic of all causes. Uh, three, and, and he said overall, 300 children are alive now that would not have been alive if it wasn't for the pandemic. And, uh, and then he pointed out why, and you know why on its accidents and, and all the other causes of death, all of them rare, but they add up to overall, fewer children have died, even including the ones that have died of COVID. Uh, but of course, the paradox of course, is that we know who the ones who died of COVID or the other causes, but we will never know who those 300 were, who, who are now alive, who wouldn't have been. And I, I just thought that was a wonderful paradox of epidemiology. You can never point to which 300 families are not bereaved that would have been bereaved. And it's a broader paradox, in fact, because there are many things that happen that can have, in purely epidemiological terms, a benefit. So I might say, well, look, the great thing about the global financial crisis in 2008 was that deaths from injuries, external causes went down. We showed the same thing happened in a state by state analysis we did of the globe of the 1928, the Great Depression. So <laughs> you know, we're not going to advocate that you go, you engineer a no. global financial crisis simply to reduce deaths on the roads. What you should be doing is to be making the roads much safer. And in fact, if you look at what happened there, and, and maybe this is a good example of road traffic deaths, there was all almost no improvement whatsoever uh, during in 2008 onwards in the Netherlands wow. or Sweden because deaths were already very low. In fact, right. Sweden has had Project Zero for the last two decades to bring death rates down to zero from road traffic accidents. However, if you looked at the countries where they had a high death rate, like the Baltic states, they fell precipitously. Uh, so, you know, there are all sorts of things that are happening, but I think the big message from this is it has demonstrated that if we could get the air that children are breathing to be as clean as the water that they are drinking. And remember, if we go back to 1848 and cholera and so on, people said, well, we can never get clean drinking water. That's just ridiculous, too expensive and, and, and so on and so forth. If we could do that, then we could reduce the seasonal toll of other respiratory viruses. And there are lots of other things because remember the UK 
um, with uh, some other countries like Portugal, for example, has a very high seasonal death rate that is not seen in other countries like the Scandinavian countries, for example. So maybe this is a challenge to us to say, why do we, people say, why are you so worried about COVID when you tolerate X number of flu deaths every year? Well, maybe we shouldn't be tolerating all of those deaths. I should say we have inevitably a paper coming out which is looking at this. And uh, when you measure this excess mortality, there is a challenge in the UK because we've had quite high winter death rates in recent years as well. Mm -hmm. So our baseline is pretty high. So just the fact that our excess mortality isn't much more than that doesn't actually tell us much because we should have been much lower to begin with. <laughs> okay, I knew you'd have an answer, you always do. So, okay, lots of people still asking. And so Carol Blackett, for example, has asked us, is there ever going to be an end to the COVID pandemic? Now, before you answer that, I just want to quote Hans Kluge, and again, like the fact that the <laughs> director is coming to talk to us, or you. Um, now, he just said very recently, he said that... Um, he said that Europe is now entering, he called it a long period of tranquility amounting to a ceasefire with COVID. Now, it's not a peace treaty, let alone an unconditional surrender. But, you know, a ceasefire is not bad, is it? You know, is, that, is, that, is that, you know, the end of the beginning, as we might say? Yeah. I've run out of historical quotes now, so over to you. Yeah, I, I, I don't think Hans actually meant to give that impression and the words were used. Uh, he can speak for himself. But if you look at the press briefing he gave on Tuesday of this week, you will see that it was a rather different tone. And oh, that no. was more directed at Eastern Europe. So Hans and I have had quite a few discussions about this because it, it is these are very nuanced issues to get across and they are quite, quite challenging. I, yeah. I think what we have seen is that things are definitely going well at the minute but we simply don't know what is going to happen in the future. We still don't know definitively where Omicron came from. So there are a number of theories, there are three theories essentially. One is that it developed somewhere where there was no surveillance, that's unlikely. Another is that it was in somebody who was immunosuppressed, which is certainly plausible, particularly given people who are untreated with HIV. Uh, and, um, and the other is that it might be from uh, an animal reservoir that might have been evolving there. And there's some evidence of, of both of those two, the, the, the second and third okay. ideas. So, you know, it, it was very different if you look at its genetic structure, very different from the variants that went before it. So we just don't know what's going to happen in, in, in next. And, and that's why I think we're just very cautious. It would be great that you know, things worked out. I think also I'm, I'm worried a little bit that we've become complacent because Omicron is milder than what went before. When we forget that the alpha and the beta, the gamma, the delta were worse or more severe than the Wuhan variant that we had in the okay. beginning. And often I think one of the big mistakes that we have made, and maybe this is an argument for having more multidisciplinary discussions, is that people have taken models from one virus and applied it to others. So we see a debate about why we don't vaccinate for chickenpox in the UK being relevant to the decision about COVID. We made a lot of decisions on the basis that SARS-CoV-2 was going to be like influenza when it wasn't in many ways. So I, I think there's also an argument, an idea that has got currency that in some way viruses mutate to become less virulent. And the historical record does not suggest that at all. Some do, like the myxoma virus in, in rabbits in Australia, there is some argument that one of the circulating coronaviruses we have at the minute may have arisen in the 1880s, 1890s, but that's far from proven. Uh, so I think we just need to be a little bit careful before we make too, we get too complacent because we don't know what's around the corner. Fair enough. Now, one thing that whenever we talk, I always ask you the same question. I don't quite know why, but I always do. You began two years ago, almost the day, well, not quite the day, but very soon it will be. Be very, very critical of Sweden. And each time I ask you, so how's Sweden doing? And each time you tell me badly. So it's almost two years up now. How's Sweden doing? Well, Sweden is doing badly relative to its Nordic neighbours, and that's the appropriate comparison. And that's what I've said from the very beginning. You know, remember that Sweden has been, uh, we published um, a, a book, in fact, a number of Johan Mackenbach and I a number of years ago, where we developed a composite index of public health policies in Europe. And then we looked at what explained them. But essentially, Sweden and Finland were right up there at the top, Sweden, Finland and Norway, not just in terms of their public health policies, but their level of social protection, uh, their quality of housing, their building regulations, 
all sorts of things. So essentially, it's quite difficult to die early in any of those countries. So no matter what they do, even if they do make what, in my view, was a major mistake in Sweden, um, you're still not going to get that bad. I mean, you don't have apart from maybe a few bits of Malmo and a few other places, you don't have the, the overcrowding, the deprivation that we have in large parts of, you know, the whole levelling up agenda in the UK, the, the northwest, the northeast. You don't have that to anything like the same extent. You have many more people who live alone. Um, you have many people who were able to work from home. And we did paper at the very beginning showing that even though no, no formal legal mandate was brought in, mobility in Stockholm actually fell quite a lot very early on, not as much as where it, the requirement where there was a law, but people were, were changing and they were much more protected anyway. So I think if you look at the comparison with Norway, Finland and Denmark, then it hasn't done well. It hasn't done well in health terms, much higher cumulative mortality, and it has not done any better in economic terms either, uh, partly because, of course, economies are interlinked. So I, I still am not convinced that the Swedish approach was right. And I'm not sure that a lot of Swedes mm -hmm. think that either, actually. I'm not so sure about that last bit. I mean, certainly in the last six months, Sweden has been much closer to its partners in terms of certainly rates of illness. I think that's a fair point to say. We're having a break in in the back, I'm not quite sure what that is, but uh, something is. But I mean, the odd thing, though, is uh, you're quite right that the, the, the figures, certainly for mortality hospitalizations, have been far worse than in their neighbours, Norway and Finland. But... It, but I, I did a you know, snapshot, I asked my few friends in Sweden about how things are going there. <clears throat> and it was one interesting thing they said that by and large, most people, it wasn't a big political issue now. Most people were glad the schools were open, that it was mainly advice, not fines, police and the law. I mean, you know, when Norway went bad in December, they immediately banned all alcohol. Although I don't know how anyone can afford to drink in Norway anyway. But um, Sweden just restricted it from 11 p.m. and things like that. And the other thing is they're heading to a general election now and management of COVID is simply not an issue. Yeah. I, mean, I bet Boris wishes he was PM of Sweden, to be honest, mm -hmm. compared to us. So it doesn't seem to have not, despite the big changes with Finland and Norway, in general, it seems like the public are not perturbed by that and think still that they did, you know, a middle of the road performance, which is kind of what they seem to be liked. I think it's, a, I'm, I'm reflecting back before the pandemic. And we used to joke that it was so much easier to be a social researcher in Sweden than anywhere else. Because when you sent out <laughs> surveys, people responded to them. I know, that's and amazing. Did what they were told, essentially. So they accepted yeah. advice in a way that in many other countries, I mean, try doing that in Mississippi or somewhere like that, um, or um, you know, Kansas or somewhere, and, uh, where you've got yeah. some deep distrust of the state. And uh, so I think, mm. I mean, of course, we do have the Swedish Democrats as the majority popular, uh, the min very uh, minority populist party, but they've never, they've never done that terribly well. And uh, so I think that you do need to look at it in the round. And I think this is where it's really important in interpreting these data, something I said for a long time, you can divide people who do international policy work into those who look at countries as a dot on a scatter plot or who really try to understand the culture and the, the, the values, the Weltanschung, as the Germans would say, the vision of the world. And I think it's really important in terms of understanding these things, because otherwise you get outliers and you can't really explain them. Now, I'm not saying I can explain everything that's happening in Sweden, but mm -hmm. we can't make a direct analogy with a country like the United Kingdom for, for all sorts of reasons. OK. Um... Fair enough. But in, so I think, I mean, the, the Swedish verdict, I was looking at some of their press, the English language press, seems they think they've had a middling performance, but in general, it's been pretty well respected by the population, seems to be a general view there. Now then, lots of people are still going on about, you know, have we lifted our restrictions too early? But, but I, promised, I promised we would broaden a bit as well and, and talk about the future now um, of, of where we're going. And and you are extremely well known in this country, but you are even better known in Europe. And uh, you are playing a serious role as people think about what are the lessons of the pandemic, where are we going in the future. Now you're on something called the Monty Commission, which yeah. I assumed was General, you know, General Sir Bernard Montgomery, but actually it's not. It's a very <laughs> different Monty. This sounds quite serious. Tell, tell, tell us a bit about this and what you're yeah. up to. 
I'm not sure I'm that well known in the UK, but certainly I find that it's much easier to, to engage with policy uh, if you're working outside the UK, particularly if, like uh, me, you uh, took a different view as to the, the Brexit referendum than um, the 52% of the population did. But that said, yes, I am. I, 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 we, we actually finished our work, but the work is being taken forward. So about a year and a half ago, Hans Kluge, who we've already mentioned, uh, asked Mario Monti, a former Italian Prime Minister and European Commissioner, to convene a group of commissioners to look at health and sustainable development in the light of the pandemic. And I chaired the scientific advisory board as being a, as well as being a commissioner, and I drafted the, the evidence review which underpinned it. Now, it was an unusual commission because although we were talking about health, the vast majority of commissioners were not from a health background. Mario himself is a, an academic economist, president of Bocconi University. We had uh, Hella Thorning Schmidt, former prime minister of Denmark, with three former presidents of uh, Estonia, of Finland, and of Kyrgyzstan. People from central banks like Sylvie Goulard, former, uh, uh, who was it, who's in the Banque de France. Jim O'Neill, Lord O'Neill from the UK, known for his work on BRICS and Goldman Sachs and so on, but who is now very much engaged with issues around antimicrobial resistance, for example. So we're, we were people like that. And the, the idea was to try and think outside the box as to how we go forward. And so what, what did we decide? Well, first of all, we thought we'd better learn the lessons from the pandemic. And we constructed a sort of framework of thinking, well, you actually, and, and you may have heard me use this analogy before, in fact, it was in the Christmas edition of the BMJ, but a country going through a pandemic is like a ship in a storm. So you need a captain who is on the bridge and knows what they're doing and understands how the ship works. And not every country had that. You might ask, did we have anybody actually on the bridge at the time at the beginning of the pandemic? But I'll leave that aside. You need a crew which is there when the storm blows up, you're not going to an outsourcing company or a recruitment agency to bring the crew on board as they, the wind is pushing you from side to side. And you need ships that are assigned with, uh, you need social safety nets essentially in the country. You don't want holes in the deck that people can fall through. So that was our starting point. Then we looked at what happens next. And there are a whole series of things like the health legacy, the health system legacy, because health services are now working in different ways. GPs are working far harder than they did before. They may be seeing fewer people in person, but they're seeing, as we showed in a, a short piece in Lancet Digital Health, seeing far more people online. So the total has gone mm. up. And we're seeing task Definitely. shifting, new ways of working. We've got an educational deficit to pick up on. And also the fact that we are meeting over Zoom. You know, I'm not going to be traveling. You, you made reference to my travel. I'm not going to be traveling anything like as much because we can have these conversations. You know, I've already had a, a meeting with colleagues from across Europe earlier on this morning and uh, which I would otherwise have had probably at Schiphol Airport. Um, so we, we, we all sorts of things are happening that will change the way in which we go forward. So what do we decide? First of all, we need to take really seriously what we call one health. And that's the health that arises at the intersection of human health, animal health, and the environment. And that includes the natural environment, the built environment. It includes all of the microorganisms that surround them, where many of the zoonetic threats emerge from. So that's absolutely crucial. We need a much wider conception of the threats to health. So we've got that one health bit at the center, but we've got a whole series of things that we can do to make things better or make things worse. And that means really getting into the political and corporate determinants of health. It means not just looking at the things that we know are important, like peace and food and shelter, but precarious employment, digital access, Ian Buchan's work in Liverpool, showing the importance of people being able to connect to the internet to order tests, to get information. Digital access is, we, we, because we, people like us, can easily access the internet, we just assume everybody else can. They can't access to justice, access to judicial review to hold governments to account, all of these things. And then on the negative side, crime, corruption in procurement and elsewhere. So all of these things, as well as the planetary dimension, both the, the planetary bits that we can't prevent, don't look up, asteroids, and the planetary things we can do something about, like biodiversity and climate change. That was our framework. Very briefly, what do we recommend? You say, where, where do I get to this? <laughs> well, we were really fortunate in having people like Sylvie Gillard and Jim O'Neill because they were able to look back at the experience 
of the global financial crisis. Why did right. we not have a banking crisis this time in the pandemic? And the reason is that people like Mark Carney, whose book Values is a public health textbook. I mean, Mark, Mark's book is remarkable for anybody in public health should be reading it uh, because it sets out all of the issues, just like Gordon Brown does in his recent book. So, you know, these are people outside health who get it better than some of us, I fear. Yeah, I think George Soros is something the same. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, as you know, I, I chaired George's uh, advisory board in New York for a long time. So, yeah, yeah um, which immediately puts me in the camp of the enemy for a lot of people. Uh, um, forget that. But yeah, yeah, yeah same, exactly. Um, so um, the Financial Stability Board was set up af in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And essentially what it did was to require stress testing of um, central banks and requirements about liquidity. So it was saying that central banks need to be prepared for another crisis. They need to have the mechanisms on board. They need to have all the other bits in reserve. Now that's going to be important going forward because work that I'm doing with OECD and the European Commission through the European Observatory, looking at resilience, we need to have that framework. And fortunately, the G20 has endorsed this. They've got a task force looking at that recommendation going forward. Then we need to do all sorts of things around making the case for investing in health. Because as you know, if a health minister goes to a finance minister and says, I need more money, as I'm sure the Secretary of State will be doing this week, or at least saying we need the money that we have, they usually say, well, you know, all we do is pour money down the drain. But we can reconceptualize that. We can say, well, look at the pandemic. That was the consequence of not investing in public health and health systems. And you mm -hmm. pay more in the long run. So let's look at the OECD sure. IMF accounting rules so that investing, investing in health, investing in education of the workforce, investing in equipment, investing in facilities is an investment in the same way that we recognize that investing in education or digital infrastructure or transport infrastructure is important. Now, there are a whole series of other things we talked about, like vaccine equity, a pandemic treaty, that work, a, 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 a European or Global Health Threats Council, many of those things are moving forward in working groups in WHO in the G20. But I would encourage people to look at our report because I think it gives you a fresh view as to what needs to change going forward. And for me, the lesson is that if we in the health community can marshal our arguments, we will find people who are used to getting things done who are receptive to those arguments and who actually get it. The problem that many of them talk about, and we've talked about some of them before, is they say uh, that every time they talk to a doctor, the first question is, can you give me money for my laboratory? Well, sorry, that's yes. not the question. The question is, how can I help with the work that I'm doing to make the world a better place? And it may be that my laboratory benefits, it may not be, but if we can reframe that, my, my experience, my personal experience with heads of government and with people from central banks is that we will be listened to, not by everybody, but by a lot of people. Okay. We will put the link um, to the report. It's published now, is it? The Monterey it report? is, yes. It's all available. We'll on the WHO link and website. Just, we'll, put, we'll, we'll, we'll circulate that around. There's dozens more questions we're not going to be able to get to. I need to a quick bit of housekeeping. Don't go uh, at all, so stay where you are. But just to remind people, our next, uh, I think, 98th episode, 3rd of March, 12.30 on Therapeutics with Melita Irving and Chris Butler. Two extra events, one not COVID-related. This is on assisted dying on the 17th of March, a practical exploration looking at how uh, things might function uh, within a health service. Catherine Sleeman, Jill Lang, X Nice, and Nancy Preston. And then our hundredth episode of this epochal series, COVID-19 conference, two years on, 31st of March. David Nicol, our neurology friend, has asked, has anyone seen the CMO recently? Well, I haven't, but I can tell you where he's going to be on the 31st of March, David. He's going to be at the uh, extended uh, edition of this series together with JVT, Richard Horton, Sharon Peacock, John Bell, Peter Oppenshaw, all your favourites and many, many more. So do put that please in your diary, March the 19th. Um, I think the CMO might actually be doing all this clinical work, actually. I think I read that somewhere, but I might be wrong. With that. So back to you, Martin. As ever, you know, you're never dull, you're never boring. You've always 
You always know what's happening. You're a pleasure to talk to. Um, you said you won't be visiting Schiphol Airport as often as you did. This is very bad news for the airline industry, I must say. Uh, God knows how they're going to survive uh, without you, but I suspect you will be up in the air because um, the experience of meeting you on Zoom is one thing, but the experience of meeting you face-to-face is always even better. Thanks very much uh, for doing this for us. Um, you'll be back. We know that. Um, you're definitely our favorite epidemiologist ever. Uh, even when I don't, I don't always agree with you, but I always end up actually then agreeing with you, um, as we all oh, do. Thank thanks you. for doing this. Have a lovely day. And, um, and, and thanks very much for their questions. And there's no way we were going to get through them all, but we'll try and do on our catch-up episode. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Simon. It was a great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Bye, Martin. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.